Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to tonight's Trans Topics Workshop. Um, we're very glad that you're able to join us and we hope that you're gonna be able to return uh, for future seminars. Our next plan is uh, for next Tuesday, a week from tonight. And we're gonna be talking about life planning for trans folk with attorney Mark Stanziola next Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. where he's gonna be talking about how you can make sure that your wishes are affirmed in cases where you may not be able to make them. So for example, in your last will and testament, medical directives and things like that, really important topics. So we do hope that you will join us. We wanna thank our sponsor, Lehigh Valley Health Network for helping to make these events uh, possible. And we also wanna thank the Leonard Litz LGBTQ Foundation for helping us as well. We are offering these seminars free of charge to our community and we do encourage you to help us continue these programming, this programming by donating. And you can do so by texting the word GIVE to 844-909-2164. Tonight's speaker is N. Catherine Glenn. Catherine is a poet and an essayist and a former poet laureate for the county where she resides in Pennsylvania. She has published several volumes of poetry and presented and read her work in multiple venues. She's also a teacher and a parent and a spouse and a coach, and I'm proud to call her my friend. Tonight, she's going to talk about her process when it comes to writing and share some examples of her work. Then, if you are interested in doing this, we're going to invite some of you to share your work. If you're interested in sharing your work, um, once we uh, say that uh, we're opening it up, please make a mention of that in the chat that you wish to read, and then I will unmute you when the time comes for you to read. Um, please keep in mind that we do have a limited amount of time, so if you are going to read something you did, please try to keep that uh, short if you can so that uh, everybody gets an opportunity. So with that said, Please welcome my friend, Catherine Glenn. Hi, everyone. And it, from the answers to the um, questions about the band you saw, it looks like I know just about everybody here, at least those are the ones who answered the question. So um, I'm glad I invited you and thanks for coming. And I hope I don't bore you with this. OK, um, so the the title is Why Right? And, um, I want to warn you first, when I'm, I'm going to do something a little different tonight than I've done in the past. I'm going to, uh, this idea for this presentation tonight, uh, Corinne presented to me and she was thinking more along the lines of me doing something that I did at the um, Keystone Conference a few years ago, which was really read from a chapbook that I put together of poems that over the years I had written that had to do with uh, my trans experience even though on some, many of them, I didn't realize I was writing about that when I wrote about it. But um, today I wanna to talk about why trans people should write um, about themselves. I mean, I always wonder why I should do that. There's so many other things that to me are way more important in the world. I mean, you know, racial issues, um, pandemic, Congress can't get anything done. Um, the judiciary that many people can't trust, um, wealth divide, inequality, you know, hundreds of other things that are, are really incredibly important in our lives. So why should you do this? Quick story. A few years ago, I was taking a course um, that I needed to do to keep my accreditation in teaching. And I uh, enrolled in a course about drug use in adolescence. Of course, it was taught by the chief of police of a, um, a local, fairly large community uh, over along uh, northeast of Philadelphia. And um, there were only six of us in the class. Everybody was a teacher. And I came in one day for class. Um, it was a few weekends long. And I came in one day for class, and uh, two of the teachers were there. There were uh, two fellows that taught together in a, a nearby school district, and the instructor. And they were actually engaged in a conversation about the problem of trans people. The police chief was lamenting what a problem it was when he had to interface 
with a trans person and his job or his force had to. And God forbid they actually had to take somebody into the station, then what did they do with them? Um, and it was all very obvious that he was just talking about trans feminine people, eliminating everybody else. And the two teachers were complaining about how it was such an imposition on them to have to treat trans people or trans students, I should say, in their classes, at least with some modicum of respect. They were complaining about pronouns and they said, hey, if the name on the register is Bob, why do I have to call him Mary? And isn't Mary an it or, you know, I mean, it was every horrible thing you could think. And it went on for a few minutes. And I'm embarrassed to say that for most of my life, I've never interacted with any of those conversations, but this time I felt I had to. And I spoke up and I said, um, so do you folks actually know anybody who's trans? Um, I mean, you know, well, they're friends and the three of them said no. And I, I said, so why are you talking about people this way that you don't even know? And I turned to the teachers and I said, how many kids in your high school? I mean, you were talking about it's only one or one and a half percent of the popul that age group population you think is trans and talking about it like it's really an inconsequential number. And I said, how many kids are in your high school? And they said, well, there's actually two buildings. I said, well, how many are in both buildings? And they said it was about 3,500. And I said, so if you're talking about a range of somewhere between one and 2%, you're talking between 35 and 70 kids. Is that inconsequential? That's, that's better part of three full classes of students. And all they wanna be able to do is go to the bathroom and live and not have any problems. And, you know, they're all looking at me and I said, you know, I have a friend of mine who's trans, her name is Jenny and she lives about five minutes from here. Do you want me to call her? I'm sure she'd come over. About that time, the other students came in the room and the uh, police chief immediately stopped talking about that and decided to very quickly um, change the subject and start talking about opioids. So why do you need the right? Why do we need to write about this, whether we're trans or we're an ally? We need to because we have to speak up because people don't know. They, they just don't know. I, I spent this morning watching two young trans girls, one who was 10, uh, who was speaking to the Texas legislature and another who was 16 and it was a video from a few weeks ago of this young woman who was speaking to uh, the Senate panel about the Equality Act. Um, I watched one about a transmasculine fellow in Texas who was a wrestler and wanted to wrestle with the boys, wasn't allowed to because his birth gender assigned at birth on his birth certificate is female. So they made him wrestle in the women's tournament. He didn't want to. The girls didn't want him there either but that's what the law said. So again, I ask, why do you write? Um, let me start with a poem um, that I got exposed to, uh, I guess it's about 20 years ago now. Uh, I came late to poetry. I came late to writing. When I was in high school and college, I ran away from writing courses. I didn't read that much. I have a learning disability that makes reading very difficult for me. Uh, I was a science major. I, I didn't bother with so much that everybody else was reading. And uh, I didn't start writing poetry until I was 47. And a few years after that, I uh, was reading a play about poetry that a friend of mine from college wrote. Is Tom Gardner wrote this wonderful play called Ear, Eye, and Silence, uh, the title of an Emily Dickinson poem. And he starts by, um, it was produced at uh, Virginia Tech, and he starts by projecting up on a screen behind the stage a poem by Wallace Stevens called The Snowman. Hey, Corinne, do you have my um, deck, so to speak, there anywhere? <laughs> I just forgot to ask about that. The Word document I sent. Okay, guess we're not going to do that. Um, I will, I will uh, see if I can find it. Yeah, well, I'm going to read it. Anyway, it's called The Snowman. 
uh, by Wallace Stevens. And I'll read you the poem, but I want you to listen to the first line first, and then the, the last stanza in particular. The first line goes, one must have a mind of winter to regard the frost in the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow. And have been cold a long time to behold the juniper shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place. And for the listener who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and then nothing that is. Nothing that is not there and then nothing that is. It's a terribly confusing line when you listen to it in the beginning. But if you go back to the first line of the poem, you say, one must have a mind of winter, which he then describes. And it's talking about the observer, the person there lets everything else go and just sees what's there in front of her or him or them. And when I write, and as I've learned about myself, it took me a long time to be able to do that with just me. I'm winter, I'm looking at me. It took a long time for me to begin to write honestly about things that were happening within me because I didn't even wanna hear them. And I think many trans folks, well, pretty much everybody that I've ever met has had a hard time dealing with this. Um, admitting it to themselves, especially those of us who are older. It's different for a lot of younger kids because there's more knowledge out there. And, and at least in some quarters, people are more accepting, families are more accepting. I mean, when Corinne and I were growing up, the word transgender didn't exist. The internet wasn't there. We couldn't find anybody to, to talk to about it. So go down to the second page, Corinne, the next page down. So, in Tom's play, the next piece, there's poems up in the background, and there is a recording playing in the background, and it's, uh, it's the main character in the play, is just referred to as the poet. And he's talking about the Australian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who I'd never heard of either, who had just come back from World War I. Um, he had a manuscript that was apparently going to make many changes, uh, advances in philosophy. And Bertrand Russell was talking about this guy being the, the next great philosopher of the 20th century. But he was really wealthy. And as it says, then he was one of the wealthiest men in Europe and proceeded to give away his fortune when he came back. And he gave Bertrand Russell his um, manuscript, said, do whatever you want with it. I don't want to deal with it and I'm, I'm done. And then he went, to, he went to train as an elementary school teacher maybe because he was a teacher, maybe that's why I like this guy, I don't know. But his sister who still had all of her money said, she looked at him and said, this is such a waste. To which he replied, you remind me of somebody who's looking out through a closed window and cannot explain to himself the strange movements of a passersby. He cannot tell what sort of storm is ranging out there or that this person might only be managing with difficulty to stay on his feet. Sometimes I think that's probably the way a lot of people look at trans folks because they don't know. They don't have any information. They don't have any connection. There's never been um, a way to come in and, and, and talk to somebody because they think they don't know anybody. And as Corinne has often said, I've heard her in, 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 in speeches that she's given, if you know somebody who has red hair, you know somebody who's trans because being trans is as common, if not more so, than having red hair, okay? Chances are you know somebody who's trans, but they're just too scared to tell you. They don't know if they're gonna lose you. And that's one of the biggest fears that we all do. Um, we all have, I should say. So, you know, we've tried being, you know, I, I had a conversation a couple years ago with a fellow I know, and. We are talking about climate 
and I got a little um, vocal. <laughs> and, he, and he said to me, he said, well, you know, that's why I don't want to listen to you because you're screaming at me. And, um, you know, you need to calm down. Well, when you talk about trends, we've tried being calm. We've tried hiding. We've tried fitting in and blending in. We've tried being loud. We've tried being different. Nothing seems to work. And now all across the country, all of a sudden again, we are the target. And in particular, the children are the target. I've been scared to death to talk in public as Catherine because I don't want to lose my job because I haven't told my parents because I was afraid of losing people. Um, I really haven't at this point. I've lost a few. So, you know, maybe we do this and it's as simple as a story that says, hi, this is me. This is some of my story. Karen, if you still have that document, the third page. So I wanna show you uh, an example of an introduction. Um, I stumbled across this the other day. This is from somebody's bio online. Uh, her name is Nerissa. I've traded a few emails with her because I, I wanted to make sure she said it was okay if I, I, you know, showed you some of what she wrote. This actually, this bio, actually, when I printed it out uh, from the website where I found it, uh, it's seven pages long. So this is just three paragraphs. Um, her story is, is in many ways very different from mine. But there is, there's information here on this page, on these three paragraphs, that I could relate to. And um, so I'm going to screw up the French. I want to apologize to Schuyler because I've probably already forgotten it. So the first paragraph, she says, as much as I love the gorgeous clothing, the makeup, the glamour, and the feelings, my raison d'etat is, I, I screwed it up. I'm, okay. It's her reason for living. The main reason is in my femininity. It's where it all begins for me. I need to be feminine. And I had to suppress it for years while growing up. Being effeminate is my norm. My neutral place where I am honestly myself. How we express that, how we do that, how we live that for all of us is different. If I had been able to do this 40 years ago, I don't know what would have been different with my life. I'm very happy where I am now. I, I go through life with feet firmly planted in both worlds, both male and female, out and not out. And I'm managing and it's okay for now. Um, but in that second paragraph where she talks about looking in the mirror, that happened for her when she was 14. That happened for me when I was 22. Somebody asked me not long ago what it was like, you know, when I, I, I began HRT, which is hormone replacement therapy, almost five years ago now. Um, it was on my birthday, I turned 64, took the first pill sitting in my, uh, my living room holding my wife's hand. She said, will you just take the damn thing already? <laughs> And um, what I understood a couple of weeks later, after what I'll say is the novelty, the, you know, the idea of taking in the pills, all of a sudden, when I looked in the mirror, I felt comfortable with what I was looking at. And I realized that I hadn't felt comfortable with what I was looking at for 64 years. That's what I want to tell some people, some, somebody, when we're talking about this, all right? It, it's just very simple stuff. And I know that person can't understand. I'm not sure I really understand. I think accepting is probably a better word. Um, let me go to the next page. I want to um, just read something. It's not a poem. This is the first paragraph of an essay. I started writing poetry at 47. And as I wrote poetry, as I got a lot of stuff that had been backed up in my brain for decades, apparently, and I got that out um, and I got past the fear of writing poetry, 
I started looking at things that were a little bit longer. Right now, I feel comfortable writing 1500 words, essays of 1500 words. And this is the opening paragraph from an essay I wrote last year after I had the opportunity um, to be in a play. And if I think I saw one of the names pop up in the chat before, um, one of my co-actresses, Zifa, is here. Did I say that one right? I think so. <laughs> okay. And we were, we had the privilege and the honor and the amazing experience to be with 15 other amazing women in a performance of the vagina monologues. And um, Eve Ensler, the playwright, uh, about 15 years ago, added a section on trans women. And we were able to read, I was asked to be one of those three women and who read that section. It was really life-changing for me. And I felt I needed to write about it. Now, this first paragraph, if we wanna talk about writing, um, everybody says that first paragraph has to really grab people and bring them in. And um, another friend of mine who's here, I think tonight is my mentor in writing. And we, we talk about what's being taught these days in MFA schools and colleges and writing classes. And, you know, we talked one time about how, you know, writers sometimes feel like I have to load everything in that first paragraph. Okay. Well, it turns out this first paragraph really isn't about anything about what happened for me in the play. It was just, it was when I was thinking about how to write this story, I couldn't get it started until I wrote this paragraph down and I didn't want to lose it. But this also says something about me. Two years ago, I told my best friends, a hetero married couple, I'd known for close to 50 years that I'm a trans person. I was scared to death to tell them that, by the way. They weren't surprised. They said they'd known for 25 years and had just been waiting for me to say something. You can believe that. A year, a year later, the day the husband and I both turned 67, it was well, his birthday is the day after mine. He told me I really needed to quote, invest in a training bra or something because you know, you kind of look like a seventh grade girl who's starting to, you know, uh, grow. <laughs> That's great to have friends and not lose them. One of the reasons I started writing or one of the reasons that one of the things I got to do with my writing is use it as a way to explain myself to myself, a way in some cases to quietly start telling people who I really am. And, um, and in some cases a bridge to that conversation. So um, the last page, Corinne, on, on what I sent you is, you know, why are we writing? Why are you writing? And, you know, and I think a lot of times it's just, you know, this just isn't trans people. I never journaled that a lot of people do, but I read once that um, somebody's going to like your story. And it may be as mundane yet important as some grandkid who wants to know about their grandparents. My friend Tom Gardner, who wrote the play, he said his most important work is um, he interviewed his parents and he published a book about with that interview in it. This is how, you know, we have everything on computers and, and digital files and stuff, but isn't it really the verbal history that comes down and that that's what you want to do? So why are you writing? You articulate your identity or your expression, how you feel about or how you dealt with societal pressures or anything else. My friend Bob Rill came up with, you know, said one, he says, moving from amorphous, amorphousness to clarity, from not knowing to being certain or as certain as you can be, to express a sense of hope. Um, to tell your own story. Okay, so um, let's talk about a little poetry because I know that, you know, Corinne's been waiting for this all day long through all of <laughs> um, So I, I put together a little chapbook. And by the way, 
Um, this little book that I put together, and I'm going to hold it up. This was the original version of it that I printed at home on my own printer. And I entitled it, I Sit in Darkness, Walk in Light. Uh, I did something with this uh, chapbook that was a big step for me. I submitted it to a contest a couple months ago. I'm not expecting to win. And I'll find that is confirmed in two days on April 15th when they tell everybody in the world who won the contest. Um, but it was important for me to do this because I, it was my first entry uh, of, a, of a chapbook of a significant amount of my work. That's Catherine. I've submitted essay, you know, an essay, the one I just read from has been rejected twice. Um, but the poetry was more meaningful to me in, in many ways. And uh, this is a big step to, to do this as Catherine. So in this, uh, in this chapbook, which now has a, I think a, 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 I might be playing with a new name, uh, Hiding in Plain Sight, um, there are 18, 20 poems, one little essay. Um, they're submitted in order of when they were written. The table of contents has the year they were written. The other thing I did was um, I printed them as they first arrived on paper with me. My process is I usually write by hand and then immediately go to a computer or as, as quickly as I can. And the majority of any rewrite that I do is in that transition, in that translating the poem from my handwritten form or notes or whatever onto the computer. Very rarely do I go back and revise. Um, but these poems are um, now here in this form. This is how they originally came out. And I'm looking, so we got, we're in about 30 minutes now. Um, let me read a few to you. I did not send them to Corinne because I wasn't really sure what I was going to read. So let's start with an early one from, uh, actually I wrote this 21 years ago in 2000. It's one of the first poems in the booklet. It's called, If, o if I Only Could, If Only I Could. If only the heat and thickness of the equator was all I knew, what would ice and snow mean to me? If only I could look beyond dreams and fantasy, what would love hold for me? If only the sand and white dryness of desert was all I knew, what would rain mean to me? If only I could let go of fear and imagine control. How much passion would there be? If only I could take a step down a path, what would life hold for me? If only I could. 21 years ago, you know, I never really showed this poem to anybody. I actually thought it was horrible. Um, but as I go back and look at it, it, it's really what I was feeling at the time. Um, that I really felt trapped. Now, that's interesting to say because um, Susie and I had been together for six months at that point. We weren't even married yet. But she was really so supportive. I really should have been looking at more of a, a light of hope, but this is the way I'd felt for so long. And um, it was beginning to get very difficult hiding, okay? Um, there's a, another poem, and, and I want to read this one. It's a little bit longer. I debated whether I should do this, but I, I think I have enough time um, at this juncture. A lot of the way I wrote wasn't necessarily looking inward at me. When I started writing, I was, well, be honest with you, to be very blunt, it scared me. Um, the first poem that showed up in 97, Scared to Live in Daylight, said to me, I had no idea where it came from. Um, it was about a comet that had arrived at that point. And I was answering a question about when I look at the comet, what do I see? And these, you know, 20 words popped out. And I had no idea where they came from. And what I, I didn't realize what it was at the time, but what I found out 
a friend of mine, Tom Gardner, told me it was a poem. And then I realized that I've been thinking about these things my entire life and thinking this way my entire life. Um, and I, I really didn't want to be negative. So I kind of made a promise with myself to really try not to be whiny. You know, woe is me. It's all about me. I mean, it, it, it's certainly when you write about this, it's personal. But I wanted to look at other things and, and see how this interface with the broader world. Um, so I, I was living in, um, a year later, I was living in Massachusetts and I was, um, well, no, I actually moved down to Philly, but I was going back to Massachusetts on a sales call from Philly. And I, I was driving up into Connecticut to stay overnight and um, I stopped at a rest stop. Here's, here's the ugly details of the story. I stopped at a rest stop on 684 on my way up to Danbury uh, to get 84 and go over to my hotel. <laughs> I went to the restroom because I had to pee, as I always do. And I got propositioned at the Earl's. And when I left, you know, I said, thanks, but, you know, no. And when I left, uh, as I drove through the parking lot, I realized what was going on. It was where um, gay guys were hooking up at this particular rest stop on 684. It's the only one going northbound on, on 684, by the way. And um, I just was thinking about that. And I decided I had to write something about it. So I got to the hotel about one o'clock in the morning and I wrote the first half of this poem. The poem's called Cruising. So I'm gonna read you the first half of the poem. I want you to just listen to the words. Uh, I'm trying to describe what's going on and how I felt about it, which isn't necessarily the way many gay people feel about this. And I, I don't wanna say anything and proper about that, as many people, this is, the, this is a lifestyle that they felt comfortable with. I had a hard time seeing it. So it's cruising. Can we choose to love? Can we choose to care? Cruising parked cars, engines quietly warming after midnight, strolls through a dance of glances, newer familiar faces each night through windows or clouded breath. A hidden life too dark for trust, but dark enough to trade life for a moment, to touch, but not to love or hold another's truth. To walk further away, deeper into the night, to search for variety, each a new spice to keep the spaces closed, loneliness alone, the questions not allowed, quiet, no sound of soul. What music then fills these moments when the heart is held in frigid embrace? Winter and summer, the screen replays the scene over and again without love. What is the search for? Where does the journey lead? Strolling alone or seated, cruising the parked cars. Can we choose not to love? Choose not to care? When we've all had a small part in creating the loneliness there. Now, my view is not everyone's view. But that's the, that's, you know, oh, by the way, the guy who propositioned me was married. It was with his wedding ring. And as I sat there and looked at this poem, um, and I thought about what a really dear friend had said to me after I got divorced. Um, her advice to me was, you know, you need to go to bars and find as many women as you possibly can and have as much sex as you can and have a good time. Yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> okay. But then I thought about that. And I was sitting there at now at two o'clock in the morning, rereading what I had just written. And then I wrote the second half of the poem. I retitled the first part that I just read, Gay. And now I'm gonna to read to you straight. Listen to what, remember what I said in the first one. Can, you, can we choose to love? Can we choose to care? Cruising packed bars, drinks slowly warming after midnight, strolls through a dance of glances, new but familiar faces each night, through windows or clouded crowds. 
a hidden life too dark for trust, but dark enough to trade life for a moment to touch, but not to hold or not to love or hold another's truth, to walk further away, deeper into the night, the search for variety, each a new spice to keep the spaces closed, loneliness alone, the questions not allowed, quiet, no sound of soul. What music then fills these moments when the heart is held in frigid embrace, winter and summer, and the screen replays the scene over and again without love? What is the search for? Where does the journey lead? Strolling alone or seated, cruising the packed bars. And we choose not to love, choose not to care. And we've all had a small part in creating the loneliness there. I changed eight words, folks. I moved it from a parking lot to a bar. It isn't any different. This is what, you know, one is, one is expected. One is the rite of passage we're all supposed to do. And the other one's horrible, but really, is it? Do we know the other person's story? Have we made that other person's story do that? I think those are questions we got to ask. And usually nobody wants to ask them. Um, so I think, Catherine, we have time for maybe one more from you. And okay. then we'll see if anybody we got even after one of theirs. What do we have? Well, we haven't got anything from anybody yet, but I'm going to. <laughs> okay. So maybe while you're reading, um, we'll and let people say, you know, if, if somebody on the call would like to read a short piece that they've done and would like to share, uh, please make a note of that in the chat. I'll make a note of it, and then I'll call on you when the time comes. If not, we will uh, continue on with Catherine. Okay. Um, so let me... So when I've lost two friends, maybe three, over this whole thing and telling them. And um, one of the fellows who I really didn't think was going to be a problem, turned out he was. Um, first thing he said to me, how come you're still married? And I, I said, you know, what do you, what do you mean? He says, well, you're trans. That means you should be with a guy, right? I said, no, because gender and sexuality aren't related. They're independent. Now, there may be some overlap, but, you know, no. I said, I'm still very happily married with Susan. So maybe I'm a lesbian. I don't know. And which was really one of the hardest questions I always had to answer myself growing up because I had the same thing. All right. If I really feel like a girl, then shouldn't I be interested in guys? Well, I'm not. You talk about already being confused over gender. And now you throw this whole stupid thing of the, the binary sexuality expectations into the whole thing. And you're thoroughly confused. So there was a, I ran a poetry series for almost 10 years and I invited a woman um, from neighboring county to read, very wonderful poet, very attractive woman. Um, really, you know, you couldn't help it, you know, hey, this is, this is a pretty lady, you know, and you're leering guy kind of thing. Um, yet at the same time, there was a jealousy going on, looking at her. And after the poetry reading, I went home and I wrote this poem. Now, I, I have been so thoroughly embarrassed about sharing this poem with anyone until recently. Um, but I wanted to, I, I wrote it because it was a way of trying to explain what was going on with me. Is that, yeah, as they, you know, guy on one hand, I couldn't help, you know, looking at this woman being attracted to her. Yet at the same hand, on the, you know, on the other hand, I'm looking at this woman saying, oh my God, I want to look like her. This is called want. It's not something to write in a notebook as they had only been dreams for so long, breasts and nose, cheekbones, hips, maybe hands. And then there were the silhouettes and dreams against the sunset or atop a ridge, tall, small waist, gentle curves. Until the reading, she, the image, was real. 
full lit, same height and that blonde that comes in shades like golden wheat with wind blowing it to waves. All the features except the waist and hips. Hers, athletic, narrow, a biker, a runner, lover of water, hands that endeared salt soil, carded stone, yet words fell from them like effortless cascades. She tried to hide her blouse revealing a taut abdomen, inviting your head, closed eyes to just breathe lying there as words fell. It was not a matter of having her. She offered whether she knew it or not. No, it was not wanting her. It was just want. Um, anything, Corinne? Any questions? Yeah, we have a, we have a couple people who'd like to read. So let's okay. start with Grayson. So Grayson, I'm going to unmute you and you'll be allowed to talk here starting right now. Okay. So you'll have to unmute yourself, Grayson, but you are allowed to speak. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yeah. This one is called Hard Man. I am not a hard man, a tower of lash spars, neath whose flesh twists hemp and cords and the joinings of ancient maritime knots. I am not a man whose proud jaw resists the storm. I am a soft man, glacially scaped, my rocky escarpments rounded, padded by alluvial deposits. The record of the currents I have faced are deeply etched into my surface, scars visible from the air. I like that. No, it's really nice. Thanks, Grayson. I like that a lot. All right, so I'm gonna mute you, Grayson. And next, we are going to hear from Aoife. All right, Aoife, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, Aoife. Great. Hi, all. Aoife. She, her pronouns. Um, okay, I'm going to do just a, a light one. Um, plot of mine are kind of heavy. Um, here we go. Transition. I am finally soft. I smell like the seaweed, the moss and the algae I've studied. I'm also hardly finished, like the seashell the tree, the bone. I have kind powers, like the gem, the root, the earth. I have meaning, like life, the life, a life. Please don't cut me. Leave me be. I'm me. That's lovely. Yeah. I like it. That's two really good ones. <laughs> They were both really, really, really. Yeah. All right, let's see if anybody else is interested in doing something short. I don't see anybody else. We'll give people another minute or two. But, you know, I want to just, you know, say that, um, you know, whether you're writing for your own pleasure. So, you know, I am certainly not a poet by any way, shape, or form. And, you know, Catherine uh, will certainly attest to the fact that I, uh, really find poetry difficult ever since like the ninth grade when I had to memorize, you know, two people meet in a snowy forest or whatever that thing was. But um, is that, you know, I love to write uh, prose and for uh, my activism, but, um, you know, I really admire the imagination and the work that people put into their um, poetry. And so both Grayson and Aoife and anybody else, frankly, who would be interested in this, we have a monthly newsletter. Um, and we've had people publish uh, you know, their poetry in that newsletter. So everything from haiku to full verse. And if you would be interested in that, um, just send me a note uh, in the chat. And uh, I'll be happy to make sure that you have an opportunity to uh, at least get your work uh, exposed to uh, about six or 700 people, which yes. is uh, nice. 
You know, it, it's really important, folks. Um, somebody, uh, a long time ago, somebody told me, you know, what's a successful poem? And the person who told me this, like, I, I can't exactly remember who, but I think I remember who it was, who was an extraordinarily successful, well-known poet, said to me, in actuality, a successful poem is one that touches one other person. If you can get the one other person, you've made a difference. And I think as we within the trans community, but as, as writers in general, if you can touch one other person, it's worthwhile. What you've said is worthwhile. It's going, somebody will remember that. It makes a difference. And yes, there's all, you know, these two young women that I watch videos of, they're making big splashes, but it takes all of us. It takes the whole community, whether the trans people, the allies, just people who care about people opening their mouths. Can you get to one other person? And I think it's important. Those two poems were wonderful. Um, while you're waiting, I'm, I want to read, we'll hold a, you know, put something in the silence here. We actually have a, a one yeah, question. Yes, else? So it says, in writing, is it like pulling a weight up a hill or like controlling water coming out of a dam? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, for me, okay. Um, what I've learned for me in my writing is that I have to be patient. Um, in the beginning, when I started writing, it turned out that I had so many things bottled up inside me. I could not write them down fast enough. I was so excited. I had to share it with everybody at once, which is really was for me at that time was the wrong thing to do. Got me in trouble a few times. Um, but what I've learned for me is to be patient with it. Um, the reason I don't rewrite much is that I do the rewriting in my head before I even start an idea comes out. I, I'm not the person that's going to wake up in the morning and I have a prompt that says, okay, go write about that tree in your backyard or go write about, you know, the deer you saw the other day. I've written about the tree and I have written about the deer when I have felt moved to do so, but not on command. Um, so for me, it, try in, in the beginning, it was, try, you know, it was the water. Yes, it was the water through my hands. What I've learned how to do is to try to pace myself so it was not that difficult pulling things up a hill. The essay that I wrote about being in the play, that was difficult. I, I felt I had to get it down. There was a pressure to get it down, but I couldn't get it started. I threw out two or three copies of it before I finally got to where I wanted to be. It's the first time I ever did anything like that. Um, but when it came, it was simple. Um, I like to say that I had a friendship with Daniel Hoffman, who was um, poet laureate of the United States in 1973 and 74. And Daniel was just, just an amazing human being and he befriended everybody. So I like to say, I, I think the best thing is say we were acquainted. We weren't close friends. We went to lunch a number of times and talked. Um, but I, I lamented to him one time that I hadn't written anything for a while. And he, he said to me, you know, I went for 20 years and I didn't write a damn thing. So I was working all the time. I was teaching. I didn't have any time to write. I was reading everybody else's stuff. I didn't have any time for my own. And I didn't do anything for 20 years. He says, but what I realized was, and what you need to realize is, go sit in the middle of the field. And I just when he looked at him. He said, you know, metaphorically, let yourself go fallow. And just let the sun shine down on you and look at the world. Go back to Wallace Stevens' poem. Have a mind of winter. Have a mind of what's around you. And soak it in. And he said, something will come in its own time. You just have to be patient. It'll be there. So looks like Aoife would like to share another one. So Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right, Aoife, you can unmute yourself. Are you there, Aoife? Well, 
should go away. No. Some help. She can't see the unmute. All right, hold on. How about now, Aoife? You should be able to unmute yourself. Oh no. The uh, Zoom gremlins have uh, decided to. Can she, can she, hey, Aoife, if you can hear me, can you? Um... All yeah. right. I was going to say, if you want to email the poem to me, I'll read it for you. You'll have to email it fast, though. Yeah. Okay. You're going to kick me off. All right. Listen, while we're waiting, I, I, I want to read, I, I want to read two more short ones. Super short. Super short. Okay. So I don't always write about me. I write about my friends, too. And um, so I dedicated this one to the greatest Zoom hostess in the world, Ren. <laughs> this is called Puberty Over Prize, because those of us who are trans know what that is like. This time, no trepidation, not unknown nor unaligned or crazy. This time, wonder and wondering converge. This time, just one me forever. Um, and then if we're going to be closing this things out in a few minutes here, uh, I, have a, uh, I have a wonderful friend. Her name is Andrea. Uh, she's a retired teacher. Um, I think she's close to, she's in her, at least in her late seventies. I don't think she's 80 yet. And she's been deeply closeted her entire life. And um, does anybody, does anybody ever pay attention to rhododendrons? <laughs> okay. So I have a rhododendron at my den door. And one of the interesting things about rhododendron, you can use them as a thermometer, roughly thermometer. If you pay attention to your rhododendron bush, when the temperature gets down to about 28 degrees, a couple of degrees below freezing, watch what happens to the leaves on your rhododendron. They curl up. They curl up into this tiny little tube, like a pencil or a cigar, okay? And as it gets colder, they tighten up even more as much as they can. And then as it warms up, they slowly unfold. And nobody knows really knows why. But the best thought is, is that the folding allows them, because you know most of any living thing is water. So what it allows the plant to do is to keep the ice crystals very tiny and that it allows it to um, keep the ice from bursting through the cell membranes and killing the plant. So this, I wrote this, I was, when I was watching that happen, winter ago, I thought about something that Andrea had said to me. So this is called comparison. It's in three little sections. My rhododendron freezes quickly and curls her broad leaves, unsharpened pencils or cigars to some. Those that think, those that know, think the curls fill with small ice Crystals that thaw only slowly, preserving the leaf. You freeze quickly, she says, when you realize. Then curl inside yourself to hide so no one will know. You cover yourself in ice that thaws only slowly to safely preserve. Each branch end is an ornament tipped with a tight green bulb anticipating June blazing violet. And I so hope that one day she can bloom. That was my dream for Andrea. Anyway, anything else? Any other questions? Also, somebody <clears throat> just made a, uh, uh, a comment around, you know, that this, so the comment is they feel like if they're like a bucket that's about to explode but they can only write in spurts and then, you know, and then it turns into an all day affair. And so, yeah. okay. Maybe yeah. how does process work? 
how does process work? Well, everybody's process is different. You know, I, I, I said to Dan Hoffman once that when I met Dan, um, he was reading for me at my, my poetry thing and he, he showed up in my house and, I, and I'm sitting there looking at him and all of a sudden, you know, we're looking at, staring at each other and you're, you're saying, oh God, the poet laureate of the United States is sitting six feet from me and he's waiting for me to ask him a question. What do you ask him? And Dan Hoffman wrote a book called um, Brotherly Love. It's a, it's, it's, a po it's a poem, it's a long form poem about uh, William Penn and purchasing Pennsylvania from the Lenai Lenape Indians. And um, it's 180 pages long. So I blurred out to Dan Hoffman. I mean, do you start out thinking you're gonna write a 180 page long poem or, you know, how does that work? And he said, you know, that's a great question. He said, it was a 10 page poem that I didn't like. I cut it in half. And then I spent 12 years writing the 170 pages in the middle. There are times for me when I write, what usually happens, I don't want to say invariably, but often. I, don't, I won't even know that I'm thinking about something or I will be honestly thinking about something. And there's a poem I didn't read tonight that I thought about for like seven years. And then one night walking up the stairs to go to bed at 11 o'clock at night, this is, I write at night, this is when it hits me. And I know exactly how you feel about that bucket that's just overflowing. I can't go to bed. I have to sit down and write it out. Because if I don't, and I've tried this, I'll just lay there in bed for two hours, okay? And then get up and have to write it down or in the two hours, forget the damn thing and then really get pissed off because I didn't write it down. For me, it ex it's like that, it explodes. I have to do it right then. When I first started writing and I don't do it now, thank God. I don't know why I'm still alive. I'd be driving, I used to uh, travel, I used to drive 65,000 miles a year for work. I spent a lot of FaceTime behind the, the, you know, the steering wheel. I'd get an urge to write something, but I needed to be somewhere. So I took out a notepad and I wrote it in my lap while I was driving 70 miles an hour on the turnpike. Boy, talk about stupid. But I know exactly how you feel. And I don't think that's bad, except if you don't go to work. Um, but it's going to happen that way. And if it does, I think you have to embrace it. I mean, that's my feeling. Everybody writes differently. I know friends who, I have friends who get up every morning religiously. They set aside time to write and to read. Um, I can't do that. I've never done that. Um, I, I tried renting a cabin by myself for a week one time and took my dog up thinking I was going to do all this writing. Yeah, I just walked around with the dog. I didn't get anything done. I needed to be home. I needed to have that urgency at, at 11 o'clock at night and staying up until two and being tired the next day. That's me to get it down. Um, so I, I think you can change process um, as you become more comfortable with your writing and as you get the urgent things out of the way. Um, and then, you know, do you have something you wanna do? I am toying with the idea of a novel. I've got a couple of essays. I have a bunch of pieces back and forth. I'm scared to death about the idea of doing this, but I also know I need to do it. And I'm just putting off sitting down and starting it. Sometimes okay. you have to make yourself do it, I think. Too. Yeah, you have to. I don't know if that helps or not, but you're not alone in that way and way you feel. Yeah. Somebody just made a comment. They said that when that happens, they call it poetry head. So. They get, they get poetry head, that's good. Well, on that note, we've hit our time and Catherine, I uh, really wanna thank you for the investment in your time and sharing your words. I wanna thank uh, you know, our readers, Grayson and Aoife uh, yeah. for their uh, words tonight. They were both wonderful and uh, really am looking forward to hearing more maybe down the road. So you never know. Yeah. Grayson, yeah, well, if I know, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll find you guys, some you folks someplace, hopefully maybe through Renaissance. I'd love to hear more of what you've written. Yeah, absolutely. So so Grayson and I are hopefully, hopefully Grayson's going to uh, publish a little bit in our newsletter for sure. Okay. And, and I know Aoife will because she'll, she'll, bout, she'll, she'll hound me until it happens. <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Hope to see you at a future uh, future workshop. Thank you. Bye. Good night.